Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no? Yeah, that's perfect. Oh, yeah. Now, you know how this works, don't you? Oh, yeah. I have my my super little blue glasses at home. You know, Do you use blue glasses? No, well, that's I right for your home set. Yeah, for home sets. I have Sony industrial monitors. The next time up, we'll see. We'll see how rich I'm feeling. <laughs> there you go. Here we go. Gorgeous lady on as a bartender. At the, All right, how about a, uh, a parking attendant? <laughs> now, now, guys, we're rolling tape now, right? Okay. Okay, here we go. Good morning. It's December 28th, 1992. For the Heritage Group of IATSC 659, this is Jay Nefsey. I'm here with Howie Block and Bob Feller. And today we're privileged to have the esteemed photographer, Alan Davio. Good morning, Alan. How are you? Good morning. Very good. Thank you so much for uh, allowing us to talk with you for our Heritage Group. You know, the Heritage, we're trying to establish our background and our, uh, um, our heritage for 659 so that we uh, can continue on doing uh, the photography we like to do. Uh, with, we, with our interviews, what we've been doing is uh, talking about your life and times and where you came from and, and, and where you'd like to go. And we'd like to start with your early history, um, where you grew up, what kind of uh, education you have, um, how that contributed to being a director of photography. Well, to begin at the beginning, um, I'm an L.A. kid. I would have been born here, except for an accident of World War II that uh, my father happened to uh, be in uh, Treasure Island an officer's training up there near San Francisco and my mother went home to New Orleans to be with her relatives when I was born. So technically I was born in New Orleans but I returned to LA at the age of two months and I've lived here ever since. Grew up in first Echo Park then Baldwin Hills and uh, I think I first became aware of my interest in photography going to movies and so on and I seem to have an early memory of noticing different kinds of color. I could even like when I was 10 years old I would notice that Technicolor movies looked different from, uh, you know, Eastman color movies and uh, or Cinecolor movies, that or True Color movies and the different things at the time. And I think that was the first recognition I had. But I had no real interest in it per se, till around age 12, in the fall of 1954, color television had really just been introduced to the country that year, and I saw color television set for the first time in an appliance store on Western Avenue called Dorn's House of Miracles. And on a Sunday, they had a demonstration of uh, the RCA uh, CT100 and a set that CBS Hytron had produced. I can't even remember the name of that. It wasn't very good. But the RCA CT100 was the very first color television set. It had an enormous cabinet, 30-some tubes, and a little you know picture like I think it was supposed to be 15-inch, but it really was massed down to about 12. And they were demonstrating on a production, NBC Opera Theater production of uh, Mozart's Abduction from the Seraglio. And my dad was always interested in things scientific, uh, and I had gone over there to see this, and I was absolutely spellbound. I, I don't know what it was, but something inside me had to find out how this worked. And I proceeded to, uh, I remember afterwards, say, gosh, couldn't we buy one? Which my father said, yeah, sure, you know, forget it. I think it was a thousand dollars for a... Uh, uh, the set in 1954, it gives you some idea of how color TV started. But I went to the library at school the next day and got the only book on color television, which unfortunately was printed in 1941 and was about the CBS field sequential system. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to the, the, the neighborhood library and got more stuff on early television. But really there was almost nothing out on how color television worked uh, until we went into, I think, some sort of a, a radio supply store one Saturday and there was a book for uh, people who had to service the new color TV sets. And that was the first information I was able to get. And from there on out, I just had to know everything about this and how it worked. And I remember by the time I started in high school, Loyola High School over on Fettus Boulevard, and I, I met some people over there that were interested in the same kind of things. And one of them had a, um, a relative who was involved with a program called Faith of Our Children, which was on Channel 4 on Sunday afternoons, and it was in color. And I remember he had made the first effort to go in and, and using his contact, as shaky as it was, had gotten in and taken some pictures inside the studio. And then I had to go in. This was at NBC Sunset and Vine, mm -hmm. if you have any recollection of that. But then I think we were right after that able to try NBC Burbank and uh, going out there to see color television and just how it was done and these enormous RCA triorthicon cameras, the TK41s. And it was easy to get in. I mean, the, the security was so bad. You could really just walk right through the gate as long as you looked like you knew where you were going. Nobody stopped you. And, mm -hmm. and you went in and you walked around and pretty soon you'd talk to engineers and some of them would talk to you and some of them wouldn't. And, but gradually you built up a number of people that 
that were impressed that you were that young and interested in the business and what was going on and wanted to learn all of these things. And, and so they would sort of back up your story that you were there to see them. <laughs> and pretty soon it was uh, to the detriment of my uh, high school grades uh, where I was spending much of my time. But the more I found out about color television, the more I knew that to understand anything about it, I had to understand something about photography. And so I took up, I got, I got into taking stills and around the same year. I got a, uh, um, I remember for my birthday, my dad, of my 14th birthday, or uh, 13th birthday, I guess it was, uh, bought me a Kodak Pony Model C. And uh, this was a, uh, a viewfinder camera, no rangefinder. It was focusing by scale, but it shot, and it had shutter speeds and f-stops, and I think it was a 3.5 lens. And I went out and I, I shot color transparencies, which were very expensive. And then I found that if I became a member of the Loyola High School uh, staff, uh, you know, photography department at the at the newspaper, that I could use their dark room. And literally, I learned to work in the in the dark room there. Uh, Mr. McDonald S. J. was the you know the guy who was the you know communicator with the photographers, and I got to go in and use the dark room, which I used principally for my own work. And uh, all this while this was going on, I became more and more interested in motion pictures, and became aware of the role of what a director of photography was because I thought I'd seen some interesting lighting for color television because when the lighting that was going on in those days the shows I, I gave Christ there was a wonderful guy named Del Jack who was uh, the NABET LDE light direction engineer out at NBC and he did I remember two of the shows that he was doing at that time were uh, the Dinosaur Chevy show on Sundays and then he was doing Lux Video Theater on Thursdays and I would be able to go out and hang out with Dell, and he let me follow him around. From I, I remember that uh, they would have like for uh, for Lux, they would have their load in on Sunday nights, and I'd go out there at Sunday night at midnight, and and watch them load in and rig. This would be more during the summer when I could get away with it without. Let's go load in and rig, and I got an, I, an idea of how much uh, work was involved in all of this. But this was live television, and I had luckily stumbled into this last decade. I mean, you have to understand live television as a phenomenon for this country was basically they, they started really selling sets in 47 and by 1960 it was gone that's right i mean it just was that little time frame video tape took over yeah at that it point. was there i remember we the, the first uh, black and white tape was um, uh, 1956 was uh, cbs was using playback douglas edwards and and black and white tape was a factor but i remember it was it was when you wouldn't they wouldn't pre-tape an insert for a live dramatic show like playhouse 90 because it was more dangerous to, to have the tape lock in than it was to do the mm -hmm. sequence live mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the sync generator was in the tape machine. Sure. So they literally had to jump sync sources to, to take tape. And uh, so tape was used primarily just for delay. And I remember it took a long time to get color. I think uh, February 59, NBC had color. It was on a, uh, a Lux, uh, not a Lux, a craft theater uh, playing back from the East Coast with Milton Berle in a dramatic role. And I remember uh, CBS didn't get it until Christmas of... Uh, of 59 and they had a production of Nutcracker out of New York that uh, they played back by color tape delay. And that pretty much was the, the thing that put the nail in, in, in live well, television. Let's ask, let's ask you a couple questions sure. about all this stuff. Because you, you've come across a lot of information just now. First off, it's remarkable that you remember the exact moment that uh, and and the store and the type of television that was that was there so well, really I own a ct100 to this day <laughs> and so does john hora because we both have stories of remembering color television from having looked at that thing i well, wish mine worked quite an impressive uh, memory that uh, it must have really grabbed you and said look at this this is uh this is something orange house at. of miracles it was absolutely the the most important moment because it was something in seeing those images on that small screen but it was incredible color and the realization that these people are standing in a studio in new york live right now doing this and i'm seeing them in color and i've watched television mm -hmm. since we got our first tv in 48 but i mean to see color television it was a whole other ball game and that got me into this, and, and, and I had to find out how it worked. And, and the more I investigated television, the more I got inter interested in photography, the more I saw films, I realized that this was a lot more impressive use of light. And I became very fascinated. I started gate crashing over at Paramount and MGM. Paramount was also easy to gate crash then. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I remember a few years ago getting to tell Charlie Lang that one of the pictures I most remembered seeing was him working on... Um, the uh, the film One Eye Jacks that was directed by Marlon Brando and I remember uh, standing on that set I had never seen so many small lights clusters and clusters mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. babies mm -hmm. and the way Charlie liked to work and having as I think back to it I mean with the light level he must have been working at this was Vista Vision 
you know, like oh. a 5859, probably working at a, you know, at least a four or five on ASA 50 yes. stock. Yes. You know, and I'm picturing the depth of field that he had to get and the, the, the way he had to work at that light level. Full candles like, of 200 oh. or so and uh, burning them up. Up there. And uh, it was very, very impressive. And I remember watching him move around that set thinking to myself, you know, this guy's got a really great job. <laughs> you know, this guy is really good because it was, it was so fascinating to watch him be involved in this the big sweep of how the scene was being staged, and then running around and, and, and adjusting all of these little babies. Yeah. I mean, clusters of them, putting all these little highlights and, 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 and having cutters brought in, and I suddenly, it just all hits you at once, the phrase painting with light, and what it meant, and what an exciting thing. So it's poor uh, live television. I mean, these poor guys were working three and four cameras at the same time. Del Jack had to have you know, this massive amount of light, and everything surrounded with 5K pans with silks on them, just to get the exposure up. And here was somebody able to get such incredible depth in a night scene supposedly lit by torches and lamplight, doing it all with these, you know, this variety of lighting instruments. And somehow that clicked again, and I really realized that director of photography was where it was at. Well, and then also in your school, you uh, went to the Jesuits. I also had Jesuits. Yeah, no wonder we're, we're dressed in black, right? The Jesuits mean? were not encouraging to me. They well, they, they let was, you use the dark room, though. They let me use the dark room. Uh, that was, well, as long as I produced some pictures for the school paper, which <laughs> weren't too many, because I think I got thrown out of the dark room finally because I had uh, uh, basically uh, used too much paper on my own projects <laughs> and not enough on the schools. But the other thing that happened at that school was I got into uh, stage lighting. Yes. It was something that was very, very influential in, in, in how I developed... Uh, you know, basically, my ideas about light because uh, I couldn't shoot a movie. We didn't have TV studios in schools then; it just didn't happen that way. And uh, we did, however, have a small the theater mm -hmm. you know, group at Loyola High School. And we did. I remember we had the Junior Play Festival, and then and then finally in my senior year, I got to light the Senior Musical, mm -hmm. which was uh, at that year uh, uh, Pirates of Penzance. And it was really something to to get in and and work in those early stages with light. And I remember we did a, a little play um, called Submerged in the Junior Play Festival that took place on a submarine. And um, it was about a guy being tr uh, trapped on a submarine as it was going down. And I remember I had one red spotlight in the, in, in the center of the stage that he was to get into at the very, very end. And I could lose all of the other light around him and just have him you know, yelling and screaming in this red spotlight as it faded out. And I, I just remembered that, that what made it impressive was leaving him in just that one light and shutting off all the other lights and being able to, some of them I had to shut off on cues with switches because I only had four dimmers. And uh, I remember that this, the whole thing was, and they were the, uh, definitely the resistance kind. And I remember that moment so well because it was just, what was this, this light going out at the way it's going out, and the color it's going out and the position that it's on is really affecting the ending of this play. I mean, it's making it much more powerful. So light and drama came together for me on a personal basis doing that play. And fairly early on. I mean, yeah, you're in yeah. high school. This was, right. this was an event that uh, you were able to design the lighting and right. uh, or, or work with the lighting, yeah. but, but make it work. No, they, nobody there was interested in doing lighting. That was the nice part, so I had it all to myself. Yeah. And uh, so it was, it was one of those things where uh, I found that when I got out of high school, I was able to... Uh, uh, you know, work in different theater companies. I remember my I, I spent one semester at Loyola University before they showed me to the door and suggested <laughs> that, that while they had enjoyed my lighting on all of their plays and uh, uh, on the spring sing and uh, my, uh, my use of their library to read all the issues of time and life and, uh, and so on, uh, they felt that I'd be better off uh, in the working world for a while because I certainly wasn't studying. And uh, it was my <laughs> usual school pattern. I think I did well in English and history and, and so on and paid no attention to any form of math or science or anything, which is interesting because I wasn't good at any scientific subjects, yet I could pursue. I remember reading a book uh, that, that probably helped me understand the photographic process and photochemistry more than anything else. It was a, uh, an English book that I think I read the 1940 edition of called uh, Color Photography in Practice by D.A. Spencer. And it was a summing up of all of the uh, color processes at the time, but it explained the whole photographic process in the most interesting way. Here was a man who wrote a book on very, very 
you know, complex subjects like masking of uh, separation negatives, and started each chapter with a quote from Alice in Wonderland. Oh, I mean, wonderful! You know, this I, I highly recommend this book. There was a later edition that I think is still in, uh, in paperback to this day. I highly recommend it. Is something that really made made it clear to me how color separation worked, how you know the processes, uh, you know, additive and subtractive, and everything that, that we were using, and because. I was still fascinated with color television, with the, the development of that, which is an additive process. I was learning color photography. I, I was uh, I had taken a, a course at Art Center School in the evening on uh, ectocolor printing, mm -hmm. which was most useful because it made me realize that it wasn't that difficult, and mm -hmm. even all the chemistry was a mess then. You had to do it in trays, mm -hmm. so you were mm -hmm. in there with those chemicals for long periods of time. But understanding color correction, understanding the subtractive color process versus the color television process because one of the things I had done in high school I had uh, I had, uh, worked weekends uh, uh, selling newspapers at uh, outside the big thrifty drugstore 111 at the corner of Ro Rodeo Road in La Brea and that drugstore was uh, was burned in the, oh. in the riots last time a nostalgia thing for me because I would work there every weekend and uh, I saved my money and bought a, a color television set because I my father was not about to and it was an RCA mark series uh, I think I got this in 1959 <clears throat> and I of course, as soon as the RCA repairman was uh, installation guy was out the door, I had the back of the set off because I had already obtained <laughs> I the service instructions. Because I wanted to get hold of the red, green, blue highlight and shadow knobs, and uh, I probably learned more from adjusting those knobs on color programs, which were not that <laughs> many in those days. But I learned more about what color and highlights and shadows. But of course, I got the set so screwed up several times that I never thought I'd get it back to zero again. <laughs> but uh, uh, eventually, I. I I was able to master that. That combined with doing ectocolor printing uh, on my own, I think, were the two things that really helped me uh, be fearless about the lab. The third thing that happened to me uh, was while I was out after I, after I'd been my formal education had been ended, I was out um, working in uh, I think at the time in an audiovisual uh, supply place, and I was doing stage lighting on uh, different plays in in the you know, small time theater in Los Angeles. Very interesting. Beginnings of Theater East was one of them, and uh, I was working in this place, and uh, they had a dark room, and uh, I remember they had a color analyzer there, Macbeth analyzer that they used for printing, and I did printing without an analyzer, and I, I you know, I, I'm so glad I, I did learn that way. But one of the things I wanted to learn more about, because of having read D.A. Spencer's book, was working directly with color separations, and I remember uh, going to this dye transfer lab on La Cienega in Pace Color Prints. And saying, if you ever need somebody, you know, an apprentice or part time work, et cetera, et cetera, I'd really love to. And sure enough, I lucked out. I got, <clears throat> the summer of 62, I got a call to come in, and I worked three months just running dye prints. I want to say at this point that I'm not a dye transfer printing expert by any means. I literally did the running of the, of, of the but prints. But you ran the machine, yeah. Yeah, I did the, the rolling out of the prints, which is basically running the matrices, the three, the mm -hmm. cyan, magenta, and yellow, which of course is the equivalent to the Technicolor printing process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one thing I missed in my career, by the time I was making motion pictures, the dye transfer printing process was gone. I never, I mean, I had, I never got to do one at Technicolor while they were still doing the uh, the old IB process. But I really got to appreciate the flexibility of that process, and mainly working for this guy, Bob Pace, who had been in color since the Carbro printing days and knew all the color processes. And I remember he taught me more, because he would get from the ad agency or the magazine, they'd send him a, a color transparency. And he would make separation negatives, and then uh, his procedure. I remember that summer we were doing a set of, of portfolios for Irving Penn, mm. and Irving Penn was was making a set, I think, of of twelve prints of each of these transparencies of what he considered his best color covers for Vogue in in the nineteen fifties. These transparencies were still all in wonderful condition. Some of the older ones, I think, one of the older ones was Kodachrome, the others were Ektachrome, and I remember we sat in there. At night, and he would have his he would make his uh, separation negatives off the transparencies, and he would make just black and white proof prints from the separation negatives, and he'd put three black and white prints up on a shelf, and and, and the color transparency on the light box, and he'd sit there and he'd look through a red filter, and he'd look through a green filter, he'd look through a blue filter, and he'd look from the transparency to the print, and he'd figure out what he was going to have to do <clears throat> to make the contrast of of each individual color work within the confines of the dye printing process, what kind of masks he was going to have to use. And I mean, I just remember ha he'd have me look through those filters. Believe me, I was not understanding you know, what he was understanding, but it was fantastic to get in your mind how color separation worked that well. 
and it helped me later on. I think all of this was incredible background for the yes. first time I dealt with a motion picture laboratory. So I tended to be laboratory oriented, even though my own photography at that time, and I was doing uh, portfolios for, uh, for actresses and models, which was a great way to meet girls and, and uh, Works, the rest of that. Sure. Of course, you'd never made a cent. In fact, usually it cost you money because they never had any money to pay for them. But uh, I remember taking pictures. I, was, I, I did some of them uh, in um, Agfa negative, which was an unmasked color negative, and I made my own prints sometimes for, from those pictures. And uh, it was all very, very instructional. But... Uh, my only lighting that I was really getting to do was stage lighting or very simple photographic studio lighting and I knew that I had to work with motion pictures if I was going to achieve my goal. But I remember when I was about 19 years old and I guess it's uh, the first reference to it, I said, well, how do I really learn this the right way? Well, obviously I should be an apprentice to a cinematographer. The only friend we had in the business, my family had in the business because we had no show business connections at all, was a guy named Eddie Jones who was a still photographer at that time, and I think for the till the end of his career at Disney, but Eddie had started in the silent era, and I remember talking to him. I said, "Well, how do I get, how do I get into a, a, a camera department somewhere?" So on, he went, "Well, it's going to be very difficult because the union is very." He says, "I'd I'd, I'd help you, but I've got two sons." And I may need to help get in, and he said, "Well, you can go down and ask, but I don't think it'll do you any good." I remember going to the local 659 office at 19 years old and walking in. And I remember there was some kind of counter there. I remember there was a lady behind the counter and there was a guy leaning against the counter. And I've never forgotten this guy who was wearing a baseball cap. Uh, I walked up there and said, Hi, uh, can I get an application form for a, uh, being able to get into an apprenticeship program? And the sneer on their faces was just something I will never forget to this day of, you know, just, who do you think you are, kid? And I go, and I remember the lady looked at me and said, that's not the way it works. <laughs> Boy, was she right. <laughs> I mean, she was not steering me wrong. And I said, well, you know, I really would love to learn this right way. How, how, what would you suggest? Do I go to the different camera departments? And she said, I don't think that works either. I mean, something like that. Basically, they sneered me out of the place. And, you know, I never went to 659's office again until the day I came in to actually join, because I had been so, you know, completely Was that Herb Ballard that was with his baseball uh, This would have still been, no, no, it wasn't Herb Ballard, but it would have been in his administration, sure. I would have uh, thought. So I knew where I wasn't going to get in, and I talked to a lot of people, and I thought I would have an easier time getting in through television. In the meantime, I had to support myself, so I was working, uh, I, I was able, after that three-month job uh, at Pace Color Prints, I was able to go on to the old uh, Technicolor uh, Consumer Photographic Division Processing Lab in Burbank, which is now, that building is now inside the Warner Brother Gates. It's now producers number four. Mm. But it wasn't inside the gates then. I would use, I used to get the uh, the bus out to Burbank and I'd get there and I was working the graveyard shift in Ectacolor. And they liked me there because I could do my own color corrections. And uh, this was great. Working graveyard was terrific because, I mean, when you're 20 years old, I mean, what the heck, you yeah. don't need to sleep anyway. Sure. And so I was working for these different on these different theater productions. So I would be able to uh, go out and be there in the afternoon at the theater and hang lights, move ladders around, get things adjusted. Then the people would come in for the rehearsal, and I would uh, be able to stay there for the whole rehearsal. And at 11 o'clock, usually they were finished rehearsing, and I would like make this mad dash out to Burbank. Because naturally the theater I was working in was out in Westchester, oh, yeah. and I had to go from Westchester to Burbank by bus, which was interesting because I was still formulated to be one of LA's, you know, definitive non-drivers. I would I refuse to learn to drive, and so I would get out there, and uh, many times arrive at work not having slept at all. But at age 20, you know, you can sort of go on automatic pilot. And remember, they put me into a division um, called enlargements. It was a dark room because so enlargements and composites which was really a seniority gig, and you're not supposed to be working there unless you've been there a number of years. And already, I had the IA on, on my back in just this other gig. Mm -hmm. they, they were mm -hmm. like coming in. Every time the shop steward would call in the, uh, uh, the business agent, and the business agent would come by, because the shop steward wanted me out of that dark room, something fierce. The head, the guy who ran the lab, John Tutini, would have to run and hide me down in ectochrome, smashing open cassettes all night, you know, until and they, so that they couldn't find where I was. Yeah. And he put somebody with seniority into the enlargements and composites, most of which I then remake the next night. You know, but it was like this, this nightmarish thing. Well, they finally got me out of there. I remember in April, of uh, this would have been '63, uh, the big layoff after Easter had occurred, and my parents 
very kindly let me come up to Fresno. My dad's company had tra had transferred him up to Fresno at that time, and I went up there and I got a job in a discount department store in the Camera High Fi department. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that here I am, an LA kid all my life, but I go to Fresno to save money so I can buy a movie camera because I knew this had to be my next step, and uh, I wanted to get a Bolex. So I thought at the time. And so I knew that if I could live in, live with my parents and save my money, I could do this. Well, I happened to walk there, and there, a lifelong L.I. kid, I meet the guy that's going to eventually give me my first job shooting motion pictures, which is just incredible. In Fresno. In Fresno. In Fresno. Because what happened was there was a radio station up there named KMAK, and there was this incredible battle going on between these two radio stations. Nothing like this had ever been heard in L.A. And I was listening to this in the air. I said, well, I'm gonna, I've got to find something to do. I'm going to go crazy while I'm in this town. So I went down and volunteered my services as a still photographer, motion picture photographer, and, and stage lighting man to this radio station because they did different promos. And I met this guy named Ron Jacobs this total lunatic who at that time was in his early 20s he was running three radio stations one in Honolulu one in San Bernardino and one in Fresno and they were all number one and he was doing this incredible job and it was all it was late what what rock and roll radio later became all over the country and his competitor Bill Drake was later the guy that that got the job to uh, convert RKO general stations to rock and roll and this would have been in 65 and and this is after I I uh, met Ron and uh, he was very enthusiastic about my enthusiasm for film. We used to go to movies a lot together up there. And then Ron had uh, gone through all these things. He wound up in Los Angeles running Bill Drake's uh, operation to convert KHJ radio from a middle-of-the-road radio station to rock and roll. I was working in Studio City Camera Exchange at that time, having traded labs for camera stores because you know, there were two reasons for that. One, uh, um, I, I sort of enjoyed being around people and talking to them about photography. And two, as an employee of a camera store, I figured I could get a big, a big discount when I went to buy my camera. And um, so in the meantime, I w watched Ron build this radio station up, and, and I at that time said, okay, I've made my move. I was going to buy the Bolex, but the salesman came in uh, from an outfit called Cinema Beaulieu mm. showing a 16mm camera called the Beaulieu. And I think this was the original Model G. And I looked at it. This was the one with the spring wine. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it, and I said, this is the camera I have to have. The viewfinder compared to the Bolex made all the difference in the world. I mean, you had this incredible bright image and uh, very, very easy to focus. And, and it, it had a much better system of varying the speeds. Several other things. The guy said, no, you don't want to buy this one. Hang on. In about three months, we're going to have a new model out, and that's the one you should get. And so I held on to my money, and three months later, he came in, and he showed me the prototype of the Model E which was the electric drive bull you had shot a motor that went from two frames per second to 64 frames per second had a C lens mount instead of the Bolex special lens mount which meant you could use a, you know, a whole bunch of different lenses mm -hmm. on I said I gotta have it that's it I gotta have it so I bought you know that camera body I horse traded around and bought some uh, used uh, a, a very nice set of used uh, uh, ingenue uh, the 10 mil uh, the 25 mil 095 and the 7513 and I bought those three prime lenses and uh, I was just using my still tripod which was a uh, uh, what was the one lights later marketed tilt all professional mm -hmm. and so I didn't know about fluid heads then and you know I was turning teaching myself to pan uh -huh. uh, on uh, on this tilt all professional and quite frankly I think it was a good a good idea because when you start to learn uh, panning and tilting on such a bad piece of equipment. <laughs> I mean, unintended to be a motion picture tripod. It later was was very, very good. Uh, I then took this camera out. My friend's radio station was going great guns. One of the disc jockeys, Sam Riddle, had an afternoon dance party show on Channel 9. Mm -hmm. And we would go out and we would shoot uh, features on weekends of what the disc jockeys were doing. The Boss Jocks at Ontario Raceway, uh, the Big Kahuna's Luau, all these different oh, promos dance. that mm -hmm. were going on. Uh, and for the radio station, I would shoot film. Uh, I'd go out, and I think I was budgeted to have two 100-foot loads of Kodachrome, and I'd get that processed, and then I'd stay after work at the store, and I'd edit them on a Craig editor mm -hmm. through a and 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 tape or a cement splice them on the Craig splicer, and uh, they were uh, that that, that I cut this little story that would probably be a one-minute story out of this this uh, 200 feet of film. And I would deliver it to Channel 9, and Channel 9 would pay me for the cost of the film and processing. You want to know what kind of bargain I drove? I would give them my employee discount on the, <laughs> on the film and processing. And that was how I got my first pieces of film in the air. But the thing was, and the secret was, hey, somebody was paying 
for the uh, the film and the processing, and that's all that counted. And I shot these pieces, and um, my friend Ron thought they were great. I mean, it was something that wouldn't have happened. I always loved the idea that my first uh, my first job as a cinematographer was for a radio station. Sure. You know, you know, that gets to people sometimes. But this opened the big door because uh, within a year that, that uh, station was number one. And uh, by the fall of 56, RKO General was so impressed with the KHA radio operation, they said, well, you guys are so smart with the, uh, this youth audience. Why don't you do a one-hour TV show, but a music show, not a dance party show, a music show every Saturday night. And they let the radio station produce the TV show. Which you were there. You were already in there with and those it was interesting. Now, I was in there, but what had also happened was that earlier that summer, a friend of mine that I had lit a stage play for mm -hmm. years before had you know, gotten himself into UCLA, Nick Frangakis, and Nick Frangakis was going to do his Project One, and uh, he said, well, I want you to photograph it. I said, I ran into him on a bus, so help me God, on Vine Street. He says, I'm, and I, we start talking, he says, well, I want you to photograph my film. Well, that's where you and, get your contacts, on the bus. Yeah, on the bus, it's <laughs> the 85 line, you know, the same one I used to take out to Burbank. It was great. But, uh, so Nick was very excited. I said, I have my own camera and all this stuff. UCLA didn't like this idea because I wasn't a student there. Yeah. Nick said, I'll fix it, which he did, and I don't know how, the, but to somehow or another he talked Bill Adams, who was the, the teacher at UCLA at the time, into allowing this. I shot a student film called Laudate with Nick, which was, as I think back upon it, a very sophisticated form of music video, except it was done to uh, Stravinsky's Symphony of the Psalms, the Laudate section, but it was music, and it was cut like a music video would be cut, extremely stream of consciousness editing, Great. and uh, so I had this, and these... The, the, the thing is, my friend Ron Jacobs at KHJ brings this guy uh, out from New York to produce the TV show, an old buddy of his named Peter Gardner. Peter Gardner arrives and says, I need a film cameraman because I'm going to use a lot of film on the show. We're not going to be stuck just with live cameras inside. So he says, I got this guy. And he showed me some, showed him some of the clips that I had done for KHJ. And he went, yeah, well, okay, but has he done anything else? And I was able to call my friend Nick Frangakis, who had... That had not even cut original on, on Laudate and set up a screening, an interlock screening at UCLA and Peter Gardner and his associate producer P uh, Milo Perichich came over to UCLA in, in the old cinema department and sat there and Bill Adams, the guy who tried to stop me from shooting this film in the first place, was so kind he showed up in the evening and ran this interlock screening of this film and at the end the lights came on and he said tell the camera story you're leaving you know you're going to work <laughs> but uh, it was quite a pay cut I was making 150 a week at the camera store and I went to work to do the I was as the boss cinematographer for 100 a week now this was as an outside supplier you see because Channel yes. 9 had an IATSE contract and as long as the film was all put together and edited outside and delivered to the station as a finished program they didn't care now, so that's how I was able to do it now let's Again, go back a little bit sure. because you covered a tremendous and fascinating area. Uh, your family was had nothing to do with motion picture. No, where where'd your dad was your dad's business was. Uh... My dad was a, a a credit manager. He was a, a credit manager for a carpet company called Bourbon Carpets Corporation. They were a wholesale import uh, a manufacturer of uh, of carpeting, and uh, he originally went to work for them down here. Before that, he'd been with Texas Company in their credit department, and he. Mm -hmm. Went over and worked for Bourbon, and then when Bourbon uh, transferred their whole operation to Fresno, that's how my, my so uh, not even were. remotely related to uh, no. production or television. So what did they think of you? I mean, this is they didn't like it. <laughs> this is this is my mother was question. more sympathetic. She knew that uh, there was something about this that uh, you know that that I, if I was this enthusiastic, something good would come of it. But I don't think my father had uh, very high aspirations. See, this was playing. When are you sure. going to get serious? When are you going to get serious? When are you going to be serious? a lawyer? When are you going to be a doctor? When are you going to do yeah. something? Yeah, they really had wanted me to be a lawyer. Yeah. And in fact, to this day, I sometimes stand there in the middle of a crazy set going, you know, if I could listen to them and study law, <laughs> I'd be having dinner in Century City right now. I wouldn't be. But then again, you know. Then again, you're having more fun than a lawyer. No, my parents were, were really not enthusiastic about this. And uh, so it was one of these things where I was pretty much, that's why I was out on my own, and therefore I'd always had to make a living. So when I say I, I took a pay cut from the camera store over to the uh, to, to Boss City, but there I was. With this television show, we started every Monday morning with nothing. And by Saturday night, we'd have three three-minute pieces shot and edited mm -hmm. that would be going on the well, air. Well, so this is, this is your still 20. 
Yeah, I'm in my early. I'm 24 now. 24 know, now. When okay. this is going on, and this is so incredible because I'm editing as well as shooting the pieces. Well, so. and, and again, to go back for a minute, yeah. you, you had dropped out of college until you were not interested in going I back would. to pick up any degrees or anything. Well, I always said that I'd love to have gone to film school, but I didn't have the grades to get into UCLA or the money to get into USC. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the ball game then. You know, I, I think well, and, and my and film schools weren't mentioned. that sophisticated as they are today. Well, I think film schools have always depended upon uh, which class you wound up in, mm -hmm. who your schoolmates were. Look at the class of 64 at SC where you had George Lucas and Caleb De Chanel. And, uh, you know, I mean, a whole bunch of interesting people. I think that's always, film schools are really made by the students that happen to be passing through them mm -hmm. and a few very, very good teachers. But, so I didn't have, I didn't have film schools, but I had basically gotten myself self-taught in photography. And then, basically, on Boss City, I was doing on-the-job training in, in terms of this. I shot some little projects on my own for doing very simple lighting and, and, and you know, studied very carefully. I read film form and film sense and uh, Spotted Woods book and all of these things on editing and, and, and mm -hmm. what have you mm -hmm. just to understand how things cut together. Uh, five seats of cinematography, I mean, my heavens, you know, screen Ansel Adams and everything else, so sure. Confused. But mainly it was being thrown in the deep end of the pool on this television show that was the greatest advantage I ever had because there's nothing like it. I mean, you're just going to go and sink or swim and, it's, and, and we were shooting reversal film. We were shooting ectochrome reversal ASA 25 uh, you know uh, 16 outside and your exposure was there or it wasn't it was well, just reversal is positive you have to yeah. you have to have it bang on the money you have to be there or not. yeah exactly it was one way it was the only way and I, I found out certain things that we would make uh, uh, a Kodachrome daily off this ectochrome that we would then use as, as, as editing um, material we never get to to uh, edit the master because we were just basically we would order two copies of the daily. That was it. We would use one as the editing copy, and I'd, I'd justify the uh, the other one. Uh, it was a form of negative cutting, but we never cut the negative. In fact, I'd love to know where some of that footage is because sure. it all had to go to Channel Nine, and they, they probably threw it out years ago. But uh, be very interesting because Ectochrome of that age. I, I've had some Ectochrome from uh, which we retransferred somewhere later. Rock films in the '67, '68. It's fine. It's, it's absolutely it's fine. pretty stable. Yeah, yeah, it's amazingly stable. But what happened on this show was Peter Gardner had this concept of of doing different kinds of things that it was promoting the radio station but it was also making this an interesting show with regard to the music and if we could get hold of somebody if it, one of the artists was in town that had a hit record I remember the first show we had Lee Dorsey who had working in a coal mine on and we basically went out to a coal yard it was this great and had Lee Dorsey walking around lipsing I mean it was a very naive premise but and rather literal but we had Lee Dorsey on the air, and it was something entertaining, and what have you. Sometimes we wouldn't have the entertainers on, and I remember I was I, I would go out and I shot the cement plant on La Brea, uh, of the uh, abstract stuff of, of the cement little cars going up and down the belt, and and uh, some used car lot with the little plastic signs, and I shot all this stuff, and I overcranked it, and I undercranked it, and I came back, and just edited a little editing exercise out of this to you keep me hanging on by mm -hmm. the Supremes or something and that would go in there sometimes I do slideshows from the pictures I was taking out in, in, in the various B-ins and <laughs> love-ins in the early you know part of that in Los Angeles that I would put these slideshows another friend of mine Henry Diltz was doing uh, uh, slides of, of this we put his slideshows on I mean it was anything to make the show more visual we had a guy named Bob Beck who was a, a guy who was a, in the light shows, and he did graphics, uh, psychedelic graphics that we would put into this uh, into this television show. Basically, whatever we could throw in that didn't cost anything to shoot went in there. But the best part for me, as I stress, was the editing uh, as well as the shooting because I had to pick up that discipline. And the record companies were seeing some of these little pieces going on, and, and they were saying, we could use these things to help promo our artists, and they were calling Peter Garner up. Well, by the end of the 13 weeks of Boss City, the first 13 weeks, the, nothing to do with us, but the TV station and the radio station were at each other's throats so much that we were shown to the door, and uh, the TV station took over the show from the radio station. Peter Gardner went out to start a little company that you know so that we could do these films for record companies called, I remember the name, Charlatan Productions. And while Charlatan Productions was in its formative stages, we did some pieces for Dick Clark for where the action is and those kind of shows. Mm -hmm. And again, they loved us because we could do this stuff so cheaply. We were, there were two of us. <laughs> that was the <laughs> That's crew. That's what like. That was the entire crew. But I remember <clears throat> at that time, uh, I, still, I still was working, uh, let's see, I, I would work uh, Wednesday nights at the camera store because they could, uh, you know, I could go fill in out there and it was an extra few bucks to keep things going. And then at this point, 
a guy named Don Berrigan, who'd been promotions director at KHJ, called me up and he said, Alan, have I got some, he says, I'm finally going to pay you off for all of those $10 jobs that you did for me when I was turning out, these were still jobs that I did for him, for the, <clears throat> uh, let's see, the KHJ Boss 30 record lineup, which was a little thing that would be put in record stores every week, and there would always be a photograph on the front, and I'd get paid 10 bucks to shoot that photograph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said, for those jobs, he said, I'm going to pay off. He says, I'm now promotions director for the Monkees at Raybert. Oh. The Monkees TV show had gone on <clears throat> that fall, fall of 66, and it was now going into its second cycle. And he said, you can come, you know, be the still photographer. I said, I can't be the still photographer. That's a union show. They'll never let me. And he says, just show up with your cameras. It's being taken care of. They're paying a standby or something. Well, whatever the story was. So I, you know, proceed to um, do some more... Thing. I go into debt in, in my, my old camera store and, and, and I, I buy a couple of Nikon F bodies and uh, some lenses and uh, go out there and suddenly I show up. I'm the still photographer on the Monkees television show, which was an incredible adventure. Uh, first of all, it paid, but I've never made so much money. I got paid $100 a day to go for this thing. And I was working, basically, you go to work on Monday morning, you do the TV sh show Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. God help the director that went over to another day. Thursday they would have off. Friday morning we'd get on an airplane and fly somewhere. The, like one time we went to Detroit and we'd do a show in Detroit on Saturday night, another show in Cleveland, we'd fly to Cleveland right after the Detroit show, do a show in Cleveland Sunday afternoon, fly back to LA Sunday night, boom, Monday morning back to work on the TV show. Right. Fabulous. I mean, I was working six days a week. It was like, I, I mean, absolute heaven just chasing, you know, the monkeys around through these. Mad crowds of and that was in their heyday and, too, so they yeah, were a lot of fun. Absolutely, yeah. And these they were great guys. I got to tell you, they handled that whole madness so well, you know, and everything that was going on, and so on. But I, in the back of my mind, I'm working on this show, and I'm saving my paycheck stuff. I'm saving because I'm thinking, I'm like, I got them now. I'm working on the show. They're paying me. I can convert. All I got to do is get my 30 days in, and then I go to the union and I can say, you got to make me a still man, and then I can convert my still card into an operator's card, and I'm in. Yeah. Wrong. Uh, wrong. It doesn't wrong. work that way, Alan. It doesn't work that way, Alan. Because <laughs> what was happening was to keep themselves out of trouble, they were paying me through Raybert Productions, which was not a signatory company. Uh huh. And they were paying. Uh, they were paying a still photographer through. Uh, yeah, I think they, they they got caught. They weren't paying a standby. Ah. And so they got caught by the union was mad at them. So forget it. I could. I remember when I went to contract services with these things, and the guy said, "Sorry, then." Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> in the well, meantime, but, now, but wait, you you uh, are accumulating a terrific amount of experience here. You're shooting your own stuff. Yeah. You're editing your own stuff. Right. You're seeing what framing works, what doesn't. Yeah. You're seeing um, uh, how to edit in the camera and outside the camera. So right. obviously, you, you, since you're on the bench, you know what shots you need. You know when to you got need a close up here, you need to cut away there. These are very important little factors for how making, it goes on to television too. Yes, and how, how it goes it on to through, television. How mm -hmm. it comes through the television system, such as it was then. Yes, you know. and and and, uh, and making it all work for you, as well as the the politics of you know production companies and and, and how those. People hire you and all that little little Not minor. Not really, though, because at this stage of the game, I'm still just with it's just Peter Gardner and myself and, and mm -hmm. our little production company, which grew because by that late that spring, he did Peter did get a deal with a, a guy uh, named Chaz Chandler from London, uh, who was working I think basically around MGM Records and had uh, a, an artist uh, Eric Burden, and we did a the animals. Uh, yeah, we did the animals. We did uh, two sh two two, what we called rock promo films for the animals. Now I want to make something clear. No way do we take credit for the, you know, the foundation of the music video. We were one of the first, I think, that were doing what later became you known as Well, music MTV video. would like you to believe that music videos didn't exist before they yeah, did. Before they but, started. but there's a tremendous backlog. People did a lot of video things Absolutely. and film things of, of, of musicians. But what you were doing, though, was getting involved in doing those things at a very early time. Yeah, it was. It was quite early. And, and I think there were people, I think there were some people doing them in New York. I, I was an outfit called Group One. Uh, that was in, into it out here. Uh, Bobby Collins was working with the uh, John. Uh, I'm trying to think of. There's a couple of, of people doing it here. There's somebody in Detroit because I've seen some early things from Motown that I think were being done around the same time. But if if I have to give anybody credit as being the father of the modern music video, it would be Richard Lester in Hard Day's Night. Of course. I mean that's what created the concept. That's mm -hmm. where the idea really came from. Is is that uh, 
you saw that film and you saw the way that, that, that Hard Day's Night, you know, took those songs and put that energy into them. And, and basically when they would do them on the monkeys, they would call them romps. Mm -hmm. You know, is this going to be a romp or is it going to be a stand-up? Okay, stand-up was they were just playing their instruments. A romp was doing crazy things cut to a piece of music. Uh, basically, this, the idea was in the air. Everybody did it. But we were lucky to be able to work with some really fine performers because the next one we got was Jimi Hendrix. Ah. It was great. Then we went back to New York. We did a number of things in New York. I remember we did a big one for the Rascals. We did one with the, uh, Aretha Franklin. Uh, which was wonderful. We shot Aretha Franklin. Every time I look at uh, the old Angels flight, uh, you know, in downtown Los Angeles, it was still there. Still there and use it. We filmed her on the uh, oh, going wonderful. up on Angels flight, and it was that kind of a uh, of a thing. It was a, it was a real adventure. I mean, I was on the road with bands. I mean, I remember going with the association on tour with the association, and they said to me, so "I'm like, here, you hold the travelers' checks <laughs> because <laughs> we trust don't... you. We don't trust them." And I have you know, thousands of dollars in traveler checks in my hand, and I said, you pay the hotel bill. Don't give them the money. <laughs> it was that kind of a thing. But, Alan, you're getting grounded in all this with uh, with your technique, though, is what yes. I'm driving at. You're, you're, uh, it was wonderful. I mean, you know, you talk about learning, you know, in under uh, under fire, and it was, it was absolutely fabulous. And um, from there, it was around this time while I was doing this that uh, I had met some people earlier, um, a guy named Peter D.L., who uh, was involved with a, a young people's film company that was going to try and do a little project, and I, they talked to me about being a cinematographer. And it never it never happened. But then in about 1967, this guy, Steven Spielberg, who was 19 years old, wanted to shoot a, a 35 millimeter film, and he wanted to have a cameraman shoot it, and he was looking for one, and Peter Diehl said, I know this guy. And so the next thing I know, Peter... Uh, puts me in touch with uh, Ralph Burris, who was Steven's friend and producer, and Ralph Burris and Steven Spielberg come by our little Charlton Productions editing room, which was in the Sherman Grinberg Film Library over on McCadden, just south of Santa Monica, and I show them some of our, I take them to the screening room and I show them some of our, our, uh, uh, our, our music promo films, and Steven really likes to work and we talk and, and we get along, and uh, as it turned out, he had a short film to do called Slipstream, which was about bicycle racing, I said, 35 millimeter. I really haven't used 35 millimeter. I, you know, I was uncomfortable because I didn't know. Oh, I've been equipment. 16 so far. Yeah, everything had been 16. I wanted to do it, and I, but I, I came. I think I really give myself a lot of credit for realizing I didn't want to get in over my head. I said, listen, I know this French cameraman, Serge Agnere, who'd worked in the Pace Color Lab with me, and this guy has shot 35 millimeter and all the rest of this before. Why don't you have Serge be your director of photography, and I'll operate the B camera? And it was the smartest move I ever made because this was a very, very difficult project. I think we shot every weekend for like about four weekends or something uh, until they ran out of money. And uh, they never finished the film. They ran out of money, and, and, and I remember the last weekend we were in, in Long Beach or Santa Monica or someplace out there, and it poured rain from Ooh. Friday night through Monday morning, and we never got to turn, I mean, monsoon time. I mean, it was not uh, even polite. So they never got to finish the film, and Stephen was very, very depressed. But the following year, he came up with a backer to do a short film called Amblin. And that was the one, and he called me back and said, I think, you know, this is the one you should do. And I wound up shooting a test for him, and it, you know, it was like that kind of thing that he convinced this backer to put up the money. Dennis Hoffman, who owned a company called Cinefix, backed to the tune of $12,000, which was a lot of money in 1968. We did that short film, and it was a 24 minute film with no dialogue, just, you know, it exists, by the way. We color separated it and saved it. It's a piece of history. Uh, a lot of it, in, a lot of things in there make you wince. But I'll tell you, you look at it, you can really see Steven Spielberg as a director, right? Well, there. that became his springboard. That became that, his claim to fame. That got him his his contract at Universal, mm -hmm. and he was uh, at 21. He became uh, uh, the youngest you know, director. The youngest director there, and he was. They, I mean, <laughs> they immediately talk about throwing him in the deep end of the pool. They. Put him on a night gallery with Joan Crawford as his star. Oh, wonderful! Oh, yeah, that was really great. I remember I went down and I watched him shooting, and uh, is that kind of thing? Of course, he had tried to bring me along, and and uh, they had said, you know, well, we want to hire the the director, hire the girl Pam McMiller, who was the star of the film, and hire the cameraman. Well, I don't know. It still what, didn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> but I went and said to them, how, how are you going to get me into the union? And they said, well, we'll think about this. And Bill Wade was head of the camera department at the time, and I could see his eyes looking up at the ceiling. And the next thing I knew, Bill Wade said, um, I don't know, they, they came up with some plan that, well, what we'll do is we'll make you a still photographer. Because I told them about my experience. We'll make you a still photographer. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hide you in an office. You'll be a consultant, you know, for a dollar and 
45 cents an hour or whatever. We'll hide you in this office, and any day that they can't get a still photographer to come in, we'll run you down to the set, and you can be the standby still photographer. You'll come in and you'll shoot, and we'll get you your 30 days that way. Then we'll convert your card to an operator's card. I said, and I think it's the smartest thing I've ever done, I said, no, I don't think this is going to work. And I said to Stephen, I said, look, I've got this 35 millimeter film. I can go out, I can get into commercials. Stephen, I can get a commercial company to get me into the union, and then I'll be able to work for you. And he, you know, I was right. It just took 11 more years. <laughs> and it worked that way. <laughs> That's the way it worked. But I had, I'll tell you, the 70s were, I, I had to, at that point, uh, I had to go freelance. Getting started was brutal. Very, very difficult. But what it did, I think I took any kind of work I could I could get, and I think the variety of experience I got. I worked on industrials, educationals, particularly some dramatic educationals. My friend Nick Frangakis, who shot that film at UCLA, mm -hmm. wound up working for the Franciscan Communication Center downtown. I did some very interesting things for them. Very good dramatic pieces that involved coverage and things that you wouldn't have you know gotten into otherwise. Um, you know, I did industrials. I did documentaries. I was able. Uh, I, I did sports. I did a show called The Keeley Challenge, which introduced me to a director named David Vowell. Uh, uh, I did a little picture. I, I did a little low-budget picture called Bleep that was shot in 18 days in Salt Lake City, non-union, um, and met a production manager, rest his soul, Andy Babish, and Andy and, and really got me in with uh, with Wolper and all these other things. I I wound up being able to. Uh, to work in different varieties of film. That one little short that we, uh, one little feature that we did actually was a very pleasant experience. And again, it was, you know, uh, being able to do a, a, a picture while you're still in your 20s was, you know, very, very gratifying. Uh, I probably would wince if I saw it today, but I, I remember this. Then we did another one, the, the same director, uh, Dick Erdman, got another picture, but it was not a pleasant experience. And uh, it was the, uh, the birthplace of, of uh, a first picture produced by Oh, Chuck Sellier, Charles mm -hmm. E. Sellier, later founder of Schick Sun Classic Pictures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was a painful, painful experience. Um, and I really found out why there were unions and why uh, one you know, didn't want to be a director of photography in non-union films because I, I felt on that project I spent one-third of my energy as director of photography and two-thirds as basically labor negotiator and trying to get per diem for the Colorado local people and you know we had to threaten to quit twice and all of this. It was a disgusting now, experience. You, so you started a commercial company. What do you call it? No, no, no I didn't start uh, a commercial company. I just got out worked, into commercials. You got into commercials? Yeah. So, so you worked for other people? You were, I worked I worked for the beginning uh, in the beginnings of uh, Wakeford Orloff and Paisley Productions and a lot of those. This, this was at the time, I should put this in, was also right around this time 1907, let's see, after this picture, before the second little feature, I joined NABET, mm -hmm. Association of Film Craftsmen, Local 531, and this was an open union. You could get in, you had to come in and bring your reel mm -hmm. and show your reel of stuff to the people there and talk about it, and then they would, you know, um, you know, say vote to let you in if they thought your work was good, and then you had the right to work for the NABET signatory companies, which at that time I think were doing 65% of the commercials in this town. They were very, very big, you know, at, at that time, and it was a godsend because it meant that suddenly I could work, continue to work in 35 millimeter. I could continue to do, you know, it, it, it was a uh, oftentimes good sized projects, and I what I learned in commercials was really extremely valuable. Also, you came as a director of photography. Director you, of photography. You didn't have to work your way up from the bottom. <laughs> I never had a chance to because they wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let you. They wouldn't let me be a loader. So I had to start as a director of photography. It's the only way you get some work. It's the only way I could work. I had I used well I had used as you know when I bought that sixteen bull you I mean. Uh, the approach of uh, of the kid with the football gets to be the quarterback, you sure. know, and so sure. I had the camera, I got to be the cameraman, and there are ways, I think, I'll tell you this day, I wish I would have had the chance to operate for some really great cameramen, I really, it would have saved me, I think, a, you know, a lot of time and certain things, but in other ways, what can I say, it was good to be, you know, as I said, continually thrown in the deep end and to, and, and to learn that way and, and to, you know, find out what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, how do I... You know, how do I learn more about something I don't know enough about? One of the things I didn't know enough about, above all, was the politics of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and how you can absolutely massacre yourself, you know, uh, on a, a, a set, particularly in commercials, where I didn't realize that, that, that you're dealing with not just a director, but behind her, all this ad agency people and all these clients and everything else in the politics. Everyone's tapping each other on the shoulder saying, why don't you do it this way? And then yeah. it finally gets down to you and you say, ah, uh, okay. <laughs> You've got it. I mean, uh, the, the, the number of people involved. 
it was really, it was one of those experiences, I think, that, that they all contributed. Every one of those things contributed that when I finally did get my chance. And what happened was, while working on all these different things, in 1975, I met a cameraman named Andy Davis. And Andy said, you know, we're all in the same boat here. Andy, I think, was a member of the San Francisco local, but was not allowed to be, uh, you know, he could not work in L.A. It was a the standard was, oh, you're in San Francisco, way. you can't work in L.A. No, it doesn't work you know, that, that way. Kind of doesn't, thing. Work doesn't work that, that way. way. So uh, he had all these people, and he was doing pictures out of town for Gene Corman and Roger Corman. He was doing non-union stuff, and, they, and, and they, they were yelling at him for working non-union, but they wouldn't let him work in the city. And so Andy um, finally just said, uh, you know, he got together a group of, of cinematographers. We're all in the same boat. All of us had offers to do feature films. I mean, I kept doing shorts for people who kept getting features that couldn't hire me. And it was very, very frustrating, to put it mildly. And he said, look, we'll form a, a group and, and uh, file a class action suit. Mm -hmm. He found an attorney, a guy named Neil Herring. And Neil Herring was not a Hollywood attorney. He was not involved in show business in any part. And I still think this is the most brilliant thing. And he was foolish enough to try it. He was a labor lawyer. Ah. He was a guy who really believed that unions for, were, were for the protection of the people who work. You know, he says, they won't let you join? That doesn't sound like any union I've ever... And he went into this whole thing, and then he investigated. And by the time we had explained, I think Andy had explained the whole thing to him of how the roster system worked. And, and his head was rolling, his eyes And he just went, he said, if I've ever heard of anything unconstitutional, this is it. And so we got a group of cinematographers together. I remember the initial group on, on, on ours was, uh, uh, we had uh, myself, Caleb Deschanel, Tak Fujimoto, uh, Michael Murphy, um, Bobby Stedman, assistants. God, we had assistants out of New York. I'm trying to think uh, of, of who they were. We had a still man. He was the only, the still man was the only one that didn't get in in the end. But we went in and we filed this suit, and it, we couldn't have known how our timing was so incredible. But basically what happened was that we filed this suit almost at the time that, that the, the union had uh, George D.B. like the following week filed on behalf of the e-card holders for mm -hmm. discrimination because George had not been allowed to shoot Norman Is That You and mm -hmm. we didn't know each other and we both filed at the same time and George was there suing on, on behalf of, uh, of the e-card people here we are saying they won't let us in we had a news conference at the, at the press club and I remember sitting there with Caleb and a few other people and we're sitting there with all the, the newsreel lights on us and I'm looking out and there are these you know local 659 you know, members of the news division shooting this, and at the end, and I'm saying to myself, this better work or I better find something else to do with my life because if we don't get it on this, we're really cooked. The, the lights went off and the newsreel guys all came up to us and every one of them told us what a rotten deal he'd had with the union and how, you know, none of them could get out of the newsreel gig and get into, in, into production, that they weren't going to be allowed to do this and what a rotten thing it was. And, and, and they all expressed sympathy to us and that was the, the amazing thing. Uh, then what happened, and this, the other stroke of luck that we couldn't have known about was that the negotiation was coming up for the video contract. And for some reason, 659 was very concerned about this. The producers were concerned because it was one of those times where they thought everything was going to get shot on video and, you know, the next year, whatever. And the producers, I think, basically said to 659, because our suit was very interesting. We didn't sue just 659. We sued the Producers Association and the people who maintained the uh, mm -hmm. Contract Services Administration who maintained the Industry Experience roster for being in collusion, you know, to Good. prevent us from getting it. So it was a very interesting suit. If we had gone to court and won this, the whole thing would have come crashing down. And I think everybody was uncomfortable with that. They didn't want to lose the roster. They didn't want this. And, and, and basically the producers were saying, we don't want to negotiate the video deal until you get your house in order and these suits are cleared up because we don't want them hanging over our head. And in November of 76, November 12th, 1976, they announced, said, okay, the window is closed. Anybody who's been working November 11th, 1975 to November 12th, 1976, because uh, our suit wouldn't have come to trial for at least another year, uh, you can, if you, burden of proof is on you, bring your evidence down, open seasons, and you can get in. And I remember it took me two years of more of shuffling paper back and forth to get the all the evidence and all the call sheets and I, all those beloved accountants that work for commercial production companies and industrial oh, I remember companies all that. Yes. that went out into warehouses and hauled dusty boxes of stuff down so that I could find... First you had to convince them there was relevant material. They, oh. didn't, they didn't think there was proof well, at all. The thing was they did uh, they did allow you know non-signatory work and, and it was working as long as I said director of photography 
you know, and I had to argue, well, it says cameraman, you know, I mean, that's the same thing, come on, you guys call each other cameraman, anyway, finally got in, I finally got onto the roster, um, in, I think, like, the fall of 78, and, uh, so it was one of those things where I was able to go, several of the directors that worked with me in commercials were now working for, uh, Signator Houses, and I was able to work for IA Signator Houses, and then in, uh, uh, that was the first time, and I remember uh, in the fall of '79, I'd done. Oh, I, I, my friend Gerald Friedman, whom I had done a, a documentary with back in '68, uh, was now very big in TV movies, and uh, he said that he was. Uh, we're gonna pause for a. No, no, have you listed as twelve twenty one seventy nine as yeah. your initiation? Yeah, date. that's my initiation. Because what happened is I did. T I was on the roster, and I worked two TV movies in '79. Because I, I wanted to keep my name at commercial accounts, sure, you know. Sure. I mean, God, I had all these, you know, these accounts, and and if I if I, uh, you know, joined the IA, they would make me resign from NABET. So I was dancing on the wire. But what happened was I I, I got my first TV movie because Jerry Friedman uh, uh, had another cameraman set to shoot this, and he uh, he said basically, uh, gee, this cameraman just got a call to do a feature, and I'm I'll, you know I'm not going to hold him to his commitment. And he goes, who do I get? And he goes, okay, Davio, you're up. And he took me over to see Abby Singer. Well, first he took me to see the producers uh, at, at, over at MTM Enterprises. Two wonderful people, and uh, uh, Jerry and Don. And, and I'm, I'm telling you that they basically listen to Jerry. He says, I, he's only got a bunch of commercials. I don't even want to show you any film. He's going to do a great job. He's going to come in on schedule, or I'll kill him. I said, okay, well, that's, that's a deal. <laughs> then he took me to see Abby Singer, who Abby was fabulous. Singer, yes. Absolutely fabulous to me. Abby says, do you have an agent? I said, no, I don't have an agent. He said, you should. But... Because I'm a nice guy, I'm going to give you the same deal that I just gave the, uh, another cameraman on his first picture. And it was, by the way, very fair. And the only thing he says, you got to promise that you're only going to use the Panaflex for one week. <laughs> and then you're going to go on to our studio, BNCR. And uh, uh, what's a promise we didn't keep? And I've told Abby I owe him one for them. Because the director, John Toll was the operator. Uh, Hobby Jordan was the first assistant. And the whole thing revolved around hand-holding so much that this little TV movie called The Boy Who Drank Too Much, which was uh, a very good TV movie. I was very, very fortunate to, to arrive at the stage of my career where there were good TV movies were being made. And uh, we had, uh, you know, I think nine days in, in or eight days in, in um, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and ten days here on stage over at uh, CBS Studio Center, where you know, MTM was headquartered. Well, now, what, what has happened also is... Um uh, your contacts with your commercial world and your your small movies and your neighborhood contacts they're all growing up they're getting bigger they're getting yeah. they're getting uh, more influential so they want to bring you along because they work well with you and, and and it's it's moving for you I mean there's a lot of confluence of influences here that are helping you out but I can't I got to tell you the, the breakthrough of finally getting onto that roster was so major in my own mind mm -hmm. that when I was able to walk out on a you know on a Yahtzee set and shoot and not have a net dropped over me. <laughs> it was <laughs> like, I kept waiting for them to show up. Somebody's going to stop this. This is too good to be true. But I did that. I did another TV movie called Streets of L.A. also with Jerry Friedman. And then that fall, uh, I basically said it's put up or shut up time because there was some squabbling between IA and NABIN and commercials and all the rest of this. And I remember uh, a friend who had an IA signature commercial house said, I'll make the call to Jerry Smith everybody's buddy and uh, you'll be able to get in you know he says you just go down and pay you know he says uh, just just have your check and find out what to do so I had one phone conversation with Jerry Smith uh, so I I think I don't think anybody could have been more rotten over the telephone oh, to really? me as ever yeah yeah you can come in just make sure you have the check <laughs> it, was, it was like one of those oh I was so filled with no, brotherly, <laughs> the warmth of the brotherhood. But this was near the end of his run. And I came in, and I remember he wasn't even in the office, and it was one of the ladies, oh, God, since retired, that I was sworn in by standing in the Terry office. Terry or... Yeah, and Terry I remember the first thing was I came up to that counter, and I put down the check. I think it was Terry. I put down that check, and so on. I said, do you have your letter of resignation to NABET? Oh, it's always got me, because I know some NABET cameramen. They never told to resign from NABET. I tagged right off. I said, yep. So I resigned, and I gave him that copy of that, and I knew that was coming in. So that was sort of like the that, that date in, in 70, December of 79 was... 21st. Yeah, December 21st. Wow. Yeah, I remember that was sort of the cutting of all the old ties. I wasn't in the middle anymore, and, you know, was on this. And uh, 
that led, you know, it was it was like the kind of thing I went to. Uh, uh, I did another TV movie in the spring of 1980 uh, for a director named uh, William Graham, Billy Graham, wonderful, wonderful man. Mm -hmm. And he took me with him to Canada to do a little feature called Harry Tracy, uh, which I did with uh, with him up there starring Bruce Stern. Unfortunately, we were filming a Western that uh, at the uh, at the end of which I think was also in, like in December or something. Uh, we we wrapped and Heaven's Gate opened in New York, and it was sort of the thing. Where we knew this picture somehow was not going to get wide distribution, but um, oh, I forgot something very important. What had happened in the spring of 1980 before this TV movie is I got a call from Steven Spielberg. He said Jerry Friedman tells me you've been shooting great stuff, and I said, oh well, that's good. You know, he says, well, listen, Alan, I got a little two-day job. It's for the close. Uh, it's for the new edition of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and. He says, we're going to shoot the Gobi Desert, but we're going to shoot it in Baker, California. And he says, and i got to do it in two days, I promise. He says, it was a sequence that was in the original script that I never got to shoot. And he says, I thought of you because of the desert. Amblin had all been filmed out in the desert. And he says, I thought of you, you'd do well with the desert. And so I said, great. So I, I, we went out there, and it was scope and all kinds of madness. We shot this, uh, this little two-day sequence. And this was right after 1941. Stephen was not in the happiest mood you know, on Earth. He was off to do... Um, the first uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark was off to do that, going to England, and um, so you know we had. It was nice to see him. It was really lovely to 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 you know to work with him again, even though it was just the two days. He went to England. Of course, it was on that trip to England shooting Raiders that he got together with Melissa Matheson, who at that time was Harrison Ford's girlfriend. Now she's married to him, and Melissa and uh, Stephen talked about what became a little picture script called E.T. and Me. And when Stephen came back, he said, now I need to do this film for $10 million, and I need a cameraman who's fast and cheap. <sighs> and thank heavens, you know, it was at that point that I had a great agent named Randy Heron. I'd, I'd gotten, acquired an agent after my first TV movie through the production manager of the TV movie, uh, uh, Bob Schneider, who was also a writer, and he was represented by Randy over at the Tobias office. And uh, he had said, I just worked with this cameraman, and recommended me to Randy, and by the time I did my second TV movie, Randy, uh, you know, had become my agent. I was in the Tobias office. The thing that's so extraordinary about how this all works, I was in Stephen's mind a little bit, but I was by no means going to be the cameraman for E.T. Here he's searching for a cameraman. He's looking at a lot of, of reels. And he calls the Tobias office, and, and Randy said, oh, you want, and he, he asked for some film from another cameraman. And Randy said, you know, um, this is Kathy Kennedy that made the call. She, he said, you know, Stephen's friend Alan Davio that he did that little segment for uh she goes, oh, I know, Alan Sean Amblin. She says, he said, well, you know, Stephen hasn't seen his really good TV movies and or his, his recent work. And she says, oh, I'm sure he'd love to look at it. Randy gets off the phone, calls me. I'm in Arizona. There's a message on my machine. I'm in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, shooting a Lawn Boy lawnmower commercial. Your favorite? Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I pick up the messages. I call Randy. He says, if you could show anything to Steven Spielberg, what would it be? I said, well, I'd love to show him Harry Tracy, but it's still being edited and it's not available. I said, show him The Boy Who Drank Too Much, my first TV movie, because, well, it's got a whole variety of mood and lighting, and it's got a lot of nice extreme lighting in it, and it's about kids, so he'll watch it. So he, Randy, got on the wire to MTM. I'm still going on finishing my Lawn Boy commercial, flying to San Francisco to do a United commercial up there. He gets on the phone and finds out that the print of Boy Who Drank Too Much is not is in New York. It's not around. It's not available. And he calls somebody at CBS. This is what I call Rest His Soul, a great agent. He gets on the phone to C CBS, and somebody owed him a favor there. They smuggled the air print out of CBS TV City to the parking lot and handed it to Randy, who had to get it go mounted up on reels and delivered it himself to Spielberg's house that weekend. Wonderful. This is the best agent story I've ever heard. I know. This doesn't happen. <laughs> there you are. I mean, it's just one of those things. And so I come back. I'm in San Francisco. I stay overnight with my cousin Ann and her husband, and I had a you know wonderful weekend. I come back to L.A. on Sunday afternoon. This is exactly when Randy is delivering the film. I'm, I, I really don't know what's going on. I'm sitting there watching 60 Minutes, and lo and behold, the phone rings. goes, Hi, I'm Steven Spielberg. Hi, Steven. He says, yeah, listen, I'm sitting here in reel three of Boy Who uh, Boy Drank Too Much, and it looks like what my next film ought to look like. How would you like to shoot it? Boom. 
show business folks you just don't know when it's going to happen and you don't know where it's going to come from and it's the right place at the right time but if I hadn't had that agent running up the stairs delivering that print by hand could have been another cameraman that did that little picture called E.T. and me except it was called E.T. and that is how it goes. <laughs> That's wonderful. Listen, it's about 10 to 12. You said said you had a time I problem. I have to do, yeah. Um, you know, we're going to continue with these uh, interviews. And, Very good. And, and uh, this, this has been a terrific opening. Uh, if we be, may be allowed sure. sometime in the future... I, I really That's want to where talk part to, two of the story starts. That's so right. We, 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 got, we got a nice segue here. But it, it, there's so much more that we want to talk to you about sure. technique and uh, style sure. and how you see a movie. And, and you're, you're, you're so wonderful with your time and generous with your Please. with your. Uh, no stories. problem. I love doing this because it's, it's good to have it on the record. Great. Well, let's, let's continue then with part two at some later date, a few months. You got it. And, uh, and we'll uh, have Howie uh, take you off to the... One last thing. What we usually do, Howie, here's your chance. Do you, you, want, you have any questions for Alan for the moment? I'm dumbfounded. He's dumbfounded. <laughs> Alan, it's wind you up and let you go. It's wonderful. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Well, what we do also is we fade out, so say goodbye for, for now. I'll be back. Ta-ta for now. <laughs>